good morning, Grace and Peace Church. It's good to gather with you this morning. Though the circumstances are a little bit different than what we're used to, I hope that wherever you're finding yourselves this morning, whether it's at home, uh, with friends, with family, maybe with your life groups, um, that we're remembering that wherever we find ourselves today, God's Spirit is present with us. That worship doesn't have to take place within a specific location. And we're recognizing that we're doing this not out of fear or panic, but out of care and concern, which is at the heart of what Grace and Peace Church is all about. Um, we care about your safety. We care about your well-being. But we also care about God's heart to see his people gather in worship. And so while we might not be gathering in the same place this morning, um, we can gather in spirit together as the Grace and Peace community, recognizing that we gather with brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world today to offer songs and scripture and to hear his word. And so we thank you for gathering with us today in this time of worship. the one we worship today, out of the prophet Amos, the one who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name, and that's who we lift up today. Pray with me, church. Almighty God, we welcome you into our lives today, into our hearts, into our minds, into this time of worship where we offer these songs to you, inviting your spirit, inviting your presence to comfort us, to challenge us, to help us move closer. this time and this space, that you're a God whose love knows no bounds, and today we see that fully. We invite you, Lord Jesus, as we offer you these songs, lifting up the name that is above all names.
lot of uncertainty. Things are going a bit mad. It's good to know that we can rely on the truth of God's word. And here's a scripture proclaiming the power of God's spirit in the book of Second Timothy. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. down 
Welcome, Grace and Peace Church. It's good to be online with you. We're sad that we're not gathering physically together, but we want to be respectful of our community um, and, and what's going on with the coronavirus. And so thank you for just being gracious enough to tune in with us, be online with us. And um, yeah, we're just, uh, this is totally new to us. This is, this is a new season, new thing we're trying to figure out. And so, yeah, thanks for journeying with us. And yeah. Um, yeah, this, this whole online part of doing church comes out of being respectful for our community. We want to be a, a loving community. We want to love our neighbors. And so we want to allow uh, space uh, for the, the community around us uh, to slow this virus, for hospitals to be able to keep up with what's going on. And uh, we just believe it's a loving thing to do to go online uh, for the next couple weeks. And so uh, we want to keep you guys informed. Uh, just keep checking back on social media for what's going on. We'll keep things posted, uh, but it looks like this might be the new normal for the next couple weeks. Um, if you're going to be giving, go online to graceandpeacechurch.org. Um, that's how we do our tithing uh, during this time. And uh, so bless you in that process. That allows us to continue to do the things that God has called us to do and, um, and continue to keep the gospel moving forward. Uh, Matt and I recently uh, went on a trip to Haiti uh, with True Shepherd, and we're going to play that video here in a second. You'll be able to watch that and be able to get a little bit of an update of what's been happening and what you guys have been a part of. So thank you for participating in that um, through your finances and through your prayers. Uh, it's been doing some amazing things there in Haiti, and I uh, can't wait to share more of those stories in the future. So here's that clip.
welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. Awesome to see what God's doing. And uh, I just want to encourage you, continue to be the church. It's not these walls. It's not a building. It's you and I. Let's continue to live that out. Let's continue to be the people uh, that God's called us to be in our community. So find loving ways to uh, reach out to your neighbors, whether it's digitally or finding ways to uh, bless some people around you, connecting with your neighbors. Um, I've been hearing some beautiful stories of how people have been uh, getting creative in this time. So be in prayer and begin to listen to what God's calling you to do. And uh, so here's the sermon. Uh, we got Pastor Chris and May just bringing the message this morning and um, looking forward to what God's going to do in these coming weeks. All right. Thanks for joining Grace and Peace in-house and online today. Um, we are doing things a little bit different, but the main thing hasn't changed. We serve a God of order who puts chaos under his feet. And I trust that. Christ-like compassion and generosity contradict hoarding. I believe that. And I look forward to those stories when memes about stockpiling are played out. And yes, I believe we'll all gather again soon. But this is good and right in the meantime. And it kind of gets us back to our first century roots. So, yeah, it's good. So let's do this. Uh, we've been in a series called Common Ground, and uh, for several weeks we've been overhearing conversations that Jesus had during his ministry. Last week, thanks to Peyton, we listened in on a chat that Jesus had with the man most often referred to as the rich young ruler. The week before that, Nate spoke about an incident between Jesus and the apostles as they were caught up all together in a massive storm on the Sea of Galilee. If you missed that or... Uh, either one of those messages, be sure and check them out on the podcast. But if you were here, you have a little bit of an advantage. No worries, we're all gonna be on the same page in a minute. So here's something to know about all these common ground conversations. We don't always read through the chapters of the gospel like they're in strictly chronological diary order. In other words, the text doesn't read like, Dear diary, on Monday, Jesus had dinner at Pete's house, biscuits were soggy. Dear diary, it's Tuesday now, bit rainy, Jesus says we're heading to Nazareth. Oh. No, we know that sometimes the writers compiled and arranged the narrative, layering Jesus' teaching in meaningful, intentional ways. And that makes sense, because the gospel writers were tasked with presenting the life and ministry and mission of Christ to the world. And any individual's response might turn on their understanding of a well-ordered and argued case for Christ. In the case of today's conversation, we get a bit of both. We're gonna be looking at Luke chapter eight, verse 26. And if you're online with us, hit pause, grab a Bible, and get back to us. So, but for the rest of us, we do have some people in house today, here from the back. There we are. Uh, and if you have all found Luke uh, chapter 8, starting at verse 26, you'll see a story immediately prior, up in verses 22 to 25. So what's the subject there? Jesus calms the storm. Thank you. Jesus calms the storm. Right. So that story ends this way. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And the next line reads, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. So the section we're picking up today is a direct continuation of the story that Nate began, but it also adds another layer to the ongoing theme being presented by Jesus. Quick recap. Jesus and the apostles were together in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. They hit a rough patch. They all had some words with each other. The apostles were a little bent that Jesus was sleeping in a fearsome storm, and Jesus had something to say about his followers' lack of faith. But there's more to it than that. Now, here's where the advantage of prior knowledge or memory might play out. If you can recall Nate's teaching about the storm, you'll remember that that story was also one layer of a larger teaching. Nate reminded us that prior to even getting in the boat, Jesus had been teaching one single concept through multiple parables. See, like any teacher who's concerned that the whole diverse class grasp a common idea, Jesus used a variety of similes to spark connections. One that Nate mentioned had something to do with tossing seeds onto soil. 
And in that parable, there were several kinds of soil conditions. So for those sitting here, if you're playing along at home, what are some of the soil conditions? What do we got? Rocky. Rocky. Pathway, yeah. Anything else? Good vines. Yeah, vines, thorny vines, good, yeah. And then good soil. Thanks, Nate. But the seeds in the story represented just one thing. What was that one thing? Yeah, the seeds represented the shared gospel. But immediately after hearing that teaching, the disciples admitted that they did not grasp what Jesus was talking about. And Jesus said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. So sometime prior to sailing, Jesus was talking to his followers specifically about their grasp of the knowledge which was at their fingertips concerning the kingdom of God and its power. In fact, I would argue that every moment of Christ's incarnation was a lesson about the bodily present kingdom of God. But this instance is a concrete directed lesson for the disciples. In the language of education, I can tell you that Jesus is scaffolding. He's building a foundation of prior knowledge upon which he fixes new ideas and meaningful images and to which he adds experience so that the whole concept or structure finally holds together. And in this case, experience is like laboratory day and the Sea of Galilee is the lab. Now these are the conditions that we know. Jesus and his disciples are in the boat and the boat is out to sea. A test is underway and the apostles are unwitting participants. Now, you might be tempted to read this as a simple test of faith, but remember the subject that's being taught. This is about their knowledge of the kingdom of God and the related power and authority of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus tells the storm to stop and the waves obey him. The apostles see Jesus command the waves and they say to each other, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. So despite their previous lessons, not one man says, aha, that kind of power must mean that the kingdom of God is here. Let's hope it's not report card day because it's not looking good for these students and that's exactly what disciples are. Under these laboratory conditions, with the power and authority and kingship of Christ as the question, and Christ alone as the independent variable in the storm, the apostles are once again essentially saying, teacher, I don't really get it. I didn't understand the whole soil thing. I'm not sure what the deal is with the seeds. And what was that with you telling the waves to settle down? Who even are you, Jesus? I follow a couple of teacher message boards. And last week I saw a note from some teacher somewhere that said this. How do you all go about retaking tests or quizzes? About half my class failed the forces and motion test. Ends with crying emoji. I feel that. Jesus answers that. Back to the whiteboard, rework the lesson, hit the subject again. The class does not have a firm grasp of the material, which in this case is the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. The apostles have been told and taught and retaught and shown. They had this experiential encounter with the power and authority of Jesus, the one by whom the kingdom of God has broken into this earthly, terrestrial space, and the one in whom is demonstrated command over its physical elements, the waves. Whatever, back at it, teachers everywhere sigh, and they keep trying. And for Jesus, it's like lesson 1.3 to work through. Same concept, third context, land the boat. So, now let's read Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 38. It's just 12 verses. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. 
When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. They begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. He gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Okay, wow. But for just a second, forget the nudity and the number of demons and the flying pigs and ask yourself, what is the real issue we're meant to look at? We're meant to see evidence of the good news of the kingdom of God which is embodied in the person of Jesus who has come with power and authority. In the boat, Christ demonstrated absolute power over the physical realm of his creation. Jesus called creation into being and continues to take command over it even as its natural processes play out. Jesus can control natural events. Now on shore, Christ reveals his authority over the spiritual realm, the dark forces that rage against humanity, but which are subject to God who reigns over all. Jesus can control supernatural events. Let me repeat those conclusions. Jesus can control natural events, and Jesus can control supernatural events. I kind of needed to hear that today. And that's the gist of the conversation we're focusing on. And that conversation between Jesus and the demon has even more to say to us. I mean, first of all, look at the circumstances of Jesus' arrival. He hops out of the boat and onto the beach, and what do you know? There's a man possessed. We don't know, and it's not the point to speculate how he came to be that way. And the man's physical condition is no fault of his own. The malignant spirits who inhabit his being have separated him from reason and from self-care. In the same way, they've created a barrier between himself and those who might otherwise have cared for him. With that, filth has made him untouchable. So too has his habitation among the tombs. He's ritually unclean. He's ostracized from his people. We can infer that he was so offensive and dangerous to the community or to himself that he had been chained for a time before breaking free and retreating to places that no one else would dare to go. The chains, the man-made device, could not restrain the demonic power within this poor man's abused body. You want to hear that. Human means were insufficient against the forces at work here. Enter Jesus. Upon seeing the man on shore, Jesus commanded the spirits possessing the man to leave him. Upon seeing Jesus, the spirits possessing the man cried out, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Notice the lack of formal introduction. That's interesting. We go back a second, 
the apostles were in the boat with their teacher, Jesus, whom they knew, and they asked, who is this? But Jesus shows up on a beach with a man who's been living in solitary among the tombs, and that man speaks to him by name and title. At least the demons do. The opposing powers of the spiritual realm recognize each other on the beach, and the demons know full well who they're encountering and what Jesus is capable of. In this conversation, Jesus' authority and power are not in question, but they are being made manifest for the other 12 guys who also got out of the boat with Jesus. This is lesson 1.3. Jesus is king. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom has come with power and authority. Christ's authority extends over the heavens and the earth. All of creation is under the rule of God, now in the person of Christ. Even the winds and waves obey him. So does an army of demons. Do we talk about the army? Back to the scene on the beach. There's this dramatic moment. The man, not in his right mind or under his own influence, is flung down at the feet of Jesus. Don't torture me, he says, to which Jesus replies, what is your name? Now, I don't think any of us believe that the demon is unknown to Jesus. But in this lesson about power, the identity of the enemy must be revealed for the sake of the witnesses. Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. Before Jesus does battle, the conditions are made known publicly. One, this is not just a man who could be bound by human chains. This is a man possessed of unnatural, raw, and terrifying power. Number two, the demons oppose Jesus. What do you want with me, Jesus? Legion cried out, knowing that he was condemned by his unholy alliance. Number three, this is not a single demon, but an army, a legion of tormentors. When Jesus goes to battle here, the sides will not be evenly drawn. Instead, the Holy One will stand alone against a whole band of evil forces. And number four, the demons are subject to Jesus. They respond to the word of God. Then the conversation continues something like this. Jesus, says Legion, if you're going to cast us out, would you mind sending us into the pigs over there? Okay, Jesus gives that command, out the demons go, and into the lake the pigs go. And before you get mad at Jesus, gotta check our perspective. The fate of the pigs was the direct consequence of the mischief of the demons. Having failed to destroy the man they possessed, they went on to inflict some financial damage on the community's pig owners. And with that, the demons undermined the community's response to Jesus, turning them away from what might have been gratitude and worship to anger and fear. But here's the larger point. In the presence of all the witnesses, Jesus conquered the forces of Satan and brought freedom and salvation to a man. He is the priority. A man who was cast out of society was restored to a condition suitable for it. A man who was broken was made whole. A man who was driven away from access to the means of grace through the temple sacrificial system was now sitting at the feet of the one who would become the sacrifice for all. Return home and tell how much God has done for you, said Jesus to this man who was now in his right mind and just wanted to keep hanging out with Jesus. So that ends the part with, Je with Legion. Legion's gone. That battle's won. The battle, but not the war. In this encounter with Legion, Jesus revealed more of the fullness of his divine nature. Christ, who is the representation of the kingdom of God, walking around, ministering in that place, proved his authority over darkness and spiritual evil. Then this happened. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, 
because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. That's a bummer. But the town's reaction doesn't really concern me. Remember, this is lesson 1.3 for the disciples, but this might have been day one, page one for the townspeople. And Jesus left them a textbook of sorts to remind them of the miracle that took place there. Jesus told the healed man to stay behind. That man is a living reminder of the power of Christ who had worked among them. And that guy's presence would regularly blow their minds and maybe even move their hearts toward understanding salvation in Christ. And in a few years, the disciples would be back to explain all that good news to them because the apostles will learn this lesson about Jesus eventually. Well, that's them learning a lesson. But what about us? As we overhear this conversation between Jesus and Legion, what are we supposed to do with it? A couple things, I think. For one, I remember a few weeks back, Nate talked about barriers that we put up. He said there are barriers that we construct that keep other people from accessing Jesus. And there are bar barriers that we set up that self-inflict separation. I think the story of Legion points to both. In light of this story, I think we have to ask, is there anyone beyond the reach of the gospel? Or to say it in a more personal way, is there a life-giving conversation we don't have to have? Nope. When Jesus spoke to Legion, for the sake of the man he possessed, he crushed every barrier to access to the gospel for anyone. Followers of Christ are called to bear witness to Christ, and we are not permitted to discriminate or withhold the good news from anyone. We have no enemy greater than those who inhabit the dark, and Jesus cast his light even there. So, church, we gotta tear down some walls. I think we also have to ask, is there anything in me so egregiously offensive that I think the power of God's love cannot overcome it for my sake. Nope. The man on the beach was possessed by an unholy army. Beat that. Just kidding. I just mean that absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God that precedes you even calling out to him. Jesus looked at a man fully possessed by evil and spoke life into him and cast evil far from him and then tasked that redeemed man with testimony, just like any of us who are saved by grace and made righteous in Jesus. You are loved like that. So tear down your wall. On that note, if I can just share some advice I read last week. You will never speak to anyone more than you speak to yourself in your head. Be kind to yourself. That's really good advice. Let kindness begin by hearing yourself admit that God values you and chose to redeem you and that that matters. And finally this. Last Friday, the assigned Lenten reading was Psalm 51. I just read this story in Luke of Christ's compassion for this possessed man. And, and then I read the psalm and I thought, what a response. What a beautiful balm for a troubled soul. What an amazing promise of wholeness and healing. And I thought, we got to read this as a church. And we will. And that's going to help us. But let me say this. If the gospel rings true and authoritative today, and if the power of Christ's love is compelling to you, but you haven't yet allowed yourself to be embraced by it because the world has convinced you of your lack of worth or lied to you about your need to be healed from a broken mind or spirit, I want to end here by letting the words of this song minister to every part of you with the hope that everyone will experience the God's restorative power. So this is Psalm 51, set to music. 
which just has a special way of working words into our core. And this is Matt. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love. from the Gerasenes who was made clean, whose spirit was renewed and who afterward was sent to carry on as a living testimony teaching his neighbors about the power and authority of Christ. Let's accept Christ's offer of wholeness and let's us declare that God's love knows no barriers. We've shared this one story today. Let's agree to bear witness to more stories of Christ's powerful work in us when we go about whatever the rest of our week looks like. Let's close with this. Rejoice in knowing that we never walk alone. Know the grace and peace of Christ walking beside us, guiding and protecting us. Share this comfort with one another and feel his presence each moment of each day. <laughs>